Welcome to the Long Island Pine Barrens Society program. I'm Dick Amper. And I'm Kathleen Nasta. And we're here today at the Radisson Hotel in Hop Hog for the sixth annual What Are We Going to Do conference. You know, it's our annual assessment to see how we're doing in the gargantuan task of trying to improve both drinking water and surface water. The conference is produced by the Long Island Clean Water Partnership, and that's headed by Citizens Campaign for the Environment, Group for the East End, the Pine Barren Society, Yay. and by the Nature Conservancy. It's sponsored by the Roush Foundation. Yes, it is, and we're going to be finding out just how we're doing on new funding, what's going on in Rhode Island and other places where they're facing similar problems, and what we're going to be doing next. And I think we should go talk to some of the people that are attending this event today. Let's do that. Okay, let's go. Maria Holtz came out today to find out the improvements we're making in water quality on Long Island. Maria, what are you hoping to hear about today? I'm hoping to hear that they're working hard on septic revisions, that they've come up with some solutions to try and clean up the bays, get rid of some of the nitrogen. I'm hoping that there's going to be some mediation on development and generally what the state of the bays are. Kathy, I'm with Carrie Meek Gallagher. She's the regional director of the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. What are you going to be talking about today? Well, I'm here today on behalf of Commissioner Segos to provide an update on the Long Island Nitrogen Action Plan, progress made so far, and also to share some good news about all of the water quality funding that was approved as part of this year's budget. We like good news. Well, David North looks like he's about ready to start oh. the program, so let's watch. Yes, let's watch. It's my pleasure to be here again and to greet you all and to see uh, what, a, what a beautiful turnout on a not-so-beautiful morning on this still beautiful island. Uh, just to introduce myself and, again, to say how pleased I am to be here participating in this program. Just a program note, our keynote speaker, State Senator and Senate Majority Leader, John Flanagan, is delayed. He will be joining us, and we can lean on him about Long Island transportation issues, I'm sure, when he, when he arrives. So our opening speaker is also a representative in Albany. The foremost job of government is public health and safety, and that requires the active involvement of government at every level. Local leaders are playing a major role in Albany in the campaign for cleaner water for we on Long Island. New to the New York State Senate, but having already committed to making water quality a top priority in her public service is the Honorable Elaine Phillips. And Elaine's district covers northwest Nassau County, including communities near Manhasset Bay and Hempstead Harbor. Her environmental concern is island-wide. Please welcome Senator Elaine Phillips. I'd like to thank you all very, very much for coming here today and for inviting me to speak on this so important issue. It's an issue that I have been committed to as a local mayor, and it is an issue that I am more committed to um, as a state senator. And as the introduction said, although I cover the seventh Senate district, I am committed not only for Western Nassau, Nassau County, all of Long Island, but all of New York State. So thank you. And the only way that we can get this done is through things like this. I am so impressed to see the agenda with the amount of scientists, government officials, and private entities and organizations that have come together today. And the only way we are going to accomplish the many, many things that we need to accomplish accomplished is through a joint collaborative effort. And you have my commitment, and I will speak on behalf of my fellow state representatives that will speak today, that you have our commitment 
to work in a bipartisan way to get things done. We're making a lot of progress, but there's still a lot of work to be done. And how does this all happen? Right here. Right here. Right here with people like you coming together, working collaboratively, not caring about partisan lines. Let's forget partisan lines. Let's do the right thing. Let's make sure our water is protected for all of our grandchildren and grandchildren to come. So thank you very much. The Clean Water Partnership is comprised of 100 organizational members and powered by more than 17,000 individual members. There are many other groups working to restore water quality from Great Neck to Montauk. And as you know, improved water quality starts with science and technology. And that's required to help us re understand the sources of our problems and discover the solutions for restoring water quality. Here with a progress report and a view for the future is Stony Brook University professor, Dr. Christopher Gobler. Dr. Gobler. I'm happy to give an update on what I'll call State of the Bays. Uh, and you can see the two key words here, hope and at the brink. Um, we're going to start at the brink. Um, this shows you what last summer looked like on Long Island with regards to harmful algal blooms and low oxygen conditions. And you can see uh, there was no shortage of regions uh, that were uh, suffering the effects mm -hmm. of either harmful algal blooms or hypoxia. Uh, to start out with harmful algal blooms, we've been doing a lot of research on this for decades now, uh, and there's now a scientific consensus that higher nitrogen levels are either leading to these algal blooms being more intense or, in some cases, more toxic, because the toxins they make are actually nitrogen-rich compounds in several cases. So give them more nitrogen, they'll make more toxins. Uh, and so, for example, here is uh, probably the harmful algal bloom I'm most concerned about on Long Island, Alexandrium, that causes red tides. Uh, we worry about it because it makes saxitoxin. Look at all the nitrogen there. Count them up. One, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, there's seven in there somewhere. Maybe a different congener. This gets into shellfish uh, because filter-feeding bivalves like clams, oysters, and mussels filter the water to eat. And so they accumulate the cells that have the toxins, uh, and it can be a, a serious issue. For example, in Alaska with a very long coastline, people have died in the past decade uh, from consuming shellfish that have high levels of saxitoxin. This is an organism that's widespread across Long Island. You can see that right here. Uh, anywhere in red is a place that's high enough to lead to paralytic shellfish poisoning. Um, you may recall two years ago, I think maybe at this event, we even talked about the die-off of diamondback terrapin turtles uh, in 2015 in Flanders Bay, where 100 of these turtles died uh, en masse, something that's really never been seen before on Long Island uh, and regionally. Uh, and I'll just update you to say we finished the study that proved conclusively that the cause of death was due to saxitoxin. Uh, we looked in the guts of the diamondback terrapin turtles. We used DNA tracing uh, to determine they were eating rib mussels. And the rib mussels at the time had 10 times the levels of saxitoxin uh, that was permissible for human consumption. These turtles only weigh a pound or two. Uh, one mussel was enough to be a lethal dose. And you can read about that in this publication that just came out. Uh, and this is essentially just the, the, the diagram by which this happens, because we know these blooms, again, they become more toxic and more intense with more nitrogen. In this case, there was a two-step uh, not only the toxin getting to the bivalves, but then via what we call trophic transfer being transferred to the turtles. And of course, this is not an endangered species in New York, but it is endangered in many areas on the east and gulf coasts. Um, the other harmful algal bloom that probably we don't worry about with regards to human health, but has probably been the most destructive ecologically have been brown tides caused by the alga known as Oreococcus. And breaking news, uh, I'm sad to report there is a brown tide occurring right now in Great South Bay. We just found this out this week, and the pattern is very discouraging because this is a pattern that we saw in 2000 and 2008, whereby it's starting in the western part of Great South Bay, and it's starting in May. This is a month ahead of time. In those former years, what generally happens is that the bloom goes on for a very long time and then spreads throughout the entire south shore. Um, so again, the efforts that we're being put in right now are so important 
because, again, things seem to be getting worse. So let me just highlight, when you reduce nitrogen, what happens? I think we know this, but it's always good to remind ourselves. Um, the Southwest Sewer District, of course, there were problems associated with that project, but what that did is mitigate an incredible nitrogen load from the southwest corner of Suffolk County, sent it from going into Great South Bay out to the ocean. And when they did that, this is, as far as we know, the only time this has ever happened in the state of New York, seagrass came back naturally with no assistance. 3,000 acres of seagrass regrew in western Great South Bay, right where the load of nitrogen had been going in. The only time this has ever happened, and concurrently, in the eastern part of Great South Bay, that area lost 5,000 acres of seagrass at the same exact two-decade period. So it just shows how when you improve the nitrogen levels, the seagrass will recover. Another very hopeful story comes from Northport. Um, if I were to give this talk, say, in 2012, I would call Northport the poster child for saxitoxin and PSP, because every year you could see we had nearly 8,000 acres of, sea of shellfish beds closed because of toxic shellfish, and in some years, levels that were very, very high. Uh, by any interpretation, the shellfish would have been a lethal dose if there was an, someone consuming those shellfish. The Northport Sewage Treatment Plant was upgraded, as you can see, in 2012 going into 2013. They cut their nitrogen load by more than half. I'm getting the more recent data to update this again because they've upgraded again. Almost as soon as that happened, these events stopped. And I keep waiting for this to be a happy coincidence. But again, 2017, saxitoxin showing up everywhere, Northport, not at all. And we're, we're tracking not just the toxins, we're tracking the cells. The blooms are a lot less intense. So we, we published the paper in 2010 saying these events are being promoted by high levels of nitrogen and specifically sewage from the sewage treatment plant. And then they upgraded that, and we can see what's happened since then. So we're now on a fourth consecutive year, fifth if you look at the very small closure 2013, upgrade the nitrogen, and these toxic events just went away. So with that, I will wrap it up. The main points being that high levels of nitrogen are a serious threat to ecosystems, economies, pets, and human health. We know that reducing nitrogen leads to reversing of these trends, uh, and so we're going to need a continued multifaceted effort to reduce nitrogen's nitrogen levels to restore our coastal ecosystems. Thank you for your attention. It is as clear as clean water that a major focus of our quality restoration effort must be the replacement of individual septic tanks and cesspools in Suffolk County. As many as 360,000 uh, new industry must be established. But how would this work? From the Nature Conservancy, here is Chris Clapp. What I'm going to present to you today is a brief update of a, uh, a project that I worked on, a social science project that I worked on with a group of Yale students uh, this past semester, uh, looking at the potential job growth uh, associated with the emerging industry in the on-site wastewater treatment sector. Uh, cesspools, you were allowed to replace in kind, right? It took no permitting, uh, no engineering, uh, and, and typically, um, there was no maintenance. This, this culture of no maintenance leads to uh, a catastrophic failure. So you could install something 40 years ago, assume it was maintenance free, uh, assume it was functioning, uh, and then all of a sudden uh, you have a catastrophic failure which results in uh, water in your basement or, or effluent in your basement like I had to deal with last weekend, or, you ha or like what was reported in the news yesterday where you have a leaching pool or a cesspool collapsing and you have someone stuck inside of that structure. In our new realm of how we do things, you're gonna have equipment coming from uh, a manufacturer. You have uh, an industry surrounding operations and maintenance. You have a uh, survey and design people. Uh, and then you have qualified installers that are certified not only by the county, but likely also by the manufacturer. Uh, all of this then goes into uh, the plan for the home the, and, and the functioning of the home. So uh, some brief numbers to this. So with about 200,000 in the, in the most critical areas, you know, upwards of 360,000 to get the whole county done, um, you know, 
four million, four, for, for just four of these septic tanks to be upgraded could create between eight and 12 brand new jobs. Um, every single installation requires at least one skilled and one, in, one unskilled laborer. That's just for the installing crew. Uh, and then to, to contrast that with the current industry of only about 230 people. So to get to scale of where we need to get to, to even uh, at a modest pace of upgrading 360,000 homes, um, we're going to need to create this whole new industry. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, we're going to continue following up on this in a more detailed and qualitative fashion in the, in the coming year. And uh, thank you for your time. Roman Stone Construction is a distributor for Norweco, one of the individual alternative nitrogen removing systems approved by Suffolk County. Our next speaker is Bob Eichinger, who will explain how these new systems would be installed. Uh, Roman Stone is the exclusive distributor for Norweco. Uh, Norweco has been in this, uh, I, I call the decentralized on-site wastewater treatment system industry. It's a fragmented industry. It's an industry that's that's made up of a lot of small to medium-sized uh, businesses. Norweco has been in it 100 years. Uh, they've got uh, north of 120,000 systems installed for one that I'm going to talk about and close to 1,000 for a newer one. Uh, Norweco, as I said, is a 100-year-old company. They're based in Ohio. What happens is Norweco has the package. We manufacture the plant, in Bay, uh, the tank in Bayshore, and we assemble the package, so it's really a Long Island-based company doing the work. We have two different offerings, both of them approved by Suffolk County. One's what I would call a great value system. It's easy to install, it's cost effective, it's easy to maintain, and it's a small footprint system. That's a singular, that's, that's a, a, a pictorial of that, of that system up there. Then I'll also, near the end, go through the hydrokinetic, which is a system designed to reach less than 10 parts per million on total nitrogen, the drinking water standard and that's our higher treatment performance. These denitrification systems from Norweco were designed to improve water quality and to denitrify. So the Singulair, the first one I'm going to talk about, is a four-stage system. Here's the good news with the Singulair. You don't need a septic tank in front of it. The septic tank is built in. This is one we just put in the ground in Orient, um, and that's, that's the whole system right there. That's, the septic tank is the manhole that you see on the left, the aerator is the manhole that's in the middle, and the clarification units on the right. So again, you're getting advanced wastewater treatment system in the same footprint size as a conventional septic tank. The NSF certification for the hydrokinetic is the best that's ever been achieved. NSF, National Sanitation Foundation, is the underwriter's laboratory for all things water and wastewater. If you look at that third number, 7.9 million parts per, uh, parts per million, on nitrogen. That's what this system achieved in 12 months in the National Sanitation Foundation. The first two numbers are, uh, are also the best numbers that were ever achieved. So this is a system that's really designed to be below drinking water standards. Thank you very much. Bob raised the issue. The question is, what is the installation of a new nitrogen-removing system like for the Long Island homeowner? Jim Minet from Wisconsin had his septic system replaced during trials of this new technology. And this morning, Jim is here to share his experiences. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, I guess this is where the rubber meets the road. You guys um, are all homeowners, I would assume. Um, and you want to know how the system is doing, so that's why I'm here. I've got, a, I believe, five minutes and a couple slides to show you. Okay, so big mess initially. They came in. I have to tell you, it was a little daunting, but by the end of the day, everything was in the ground, leveled out, and much, really, even less than that is what's visible. Those green barrels are actually mostly hidden now uh, for the most part. You could see uh, the tank in the bottom in the installation in front of the house. Big event, the day of the uh, installation. This is after the grass was replanted and seeded, and I still have to plant shrubs in front of the, if you look at the lower left of your screen, in front of the remaining barrels. But I think once that's done, they'll be completely invisible. 
So it's a small price to pay, really, to have the system in. Now, as far as my experience, uh, I have to say it's been two years since the system's been installed, and I have had virtually no issues whatsoever. Uh, it's been maintenance-free, trouble-free, and the gentleman who has come out to look at the system from time to time has even shown me the clear water he's pulled out of the tank, which I find remarkable, and he's commented about the nitrogen levels being so low. So from a homeowner's point of view, I think it's been a great experience. Uh, I've had no issues, and I think these type of systems, if they can make the type of difference that the science indicates they do and will, uh, it's something that probably should be um, embraced. So that's really what I had for you today. Appreciate your time, and thanks for inviting me. A major component of Long Island's clean water effort is the Long Island Nitrogen Action Plan, a joint effort of the Long Island Regional Planning Council and the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. Here with a status report is the Long Island Regional Director for the State Department of Environmental Conservation, Carrie Meek Gallagher. I am uh, pleased to be here on behalf of Commissioner Sagos today to give you an update on the progress of our Nitrogen Action Plan. Everyone knows about the Long Island Nitrogen Action Plan. Uh, last year, in the 2015-2016 budget, we did get authorization, thanks to uh, leadership in the Assembly and Senate, to spend $5 million, initial funding for the Nitrogen Action Plan, and the money is funneled through the Regional Planning Council and the Department of Environmental Conservation. Uh, there are some additional modeling initiatives I just wanted to touch on. The Peconic Estuary Program has uh, received funding to do a solute transport model uh, for the Peconic Estuary. So that will actually help be helpful and tie in with these other efforts. So that's really to focus in on nitrogen loads to the Peconic Estuary Program and additional steps that can be taken to reduce uh, nitrogen there. And then, as Senator Phillips talked about, we have embarked upon a groundwater sustainability study for all of the island. And when I say the island, it includes not just Nassau and Suffolk counties, but geographic Long Island. So Kings and Queens counties are included as well in that analysis because it is important things that happen there uh, can impact what's happening in Nassau and Suffolk counties. And everyone at the aquifer doesn't know, we recognize those political boundaries. So um, it's $6 million in funding has been identified so far. Uh, there are going to be additional phases that we'd like to undertake, we've already identified, so we'll, we'll be talking about that down the road as we have some of the initial work done. But so far, there is a website that's up that talks about all of the work. There's a scope of work that's up for the groundwater sustainability study. And really the key is, so one is the big emphasis was saltwater intrusion. A lot of concerns about saltwater intrusion, especially in Nassau County. And so the focus uh, initially started there. But this is not just about looking at saltwater intrusion across the island. It's also about water supply sustainability, which is really critical. So looking at what is a sustainable yield, a safe and sustainable yield, how much water can we withdraw from the aquifer, whether it be for drinking water purposes, irrigation purposes, other purposes, um, to uh, remedial purposes, you know, trying to clean up all these brownfield sites, uh, and still have a sustainable drinking water supply, and not dry out our rivers, our streams, our lakes, all of our surface waters. So that's a big piece. And then, of course, another piece is some of this plume modeling, contaminant modeling. So where are these plumes moving, and what can we do about that? So thank you to the Assembly, the Senate, and the Governor's Office for all working together to get us that money all specifically geared towards Long Island water quality improvement efforts. And then just if you want to visit the LINAP website, it is listed up here. You can also get on our um, e-listserv. You can sign up and get the uh, newsletters that go out on a monthly basis about lineup and um, also all the other good information on water quality that you can get through the DEC website. So thank you. I know I went over by maybe a minute or two, but I did want to make sure everyone had all that. It's good to end on a happy note. There's a lot of water quality money coming to the state and specifically to Long Island this year. So thank you. This year's effort to restore, preserve, and protect our local environment includes significant flow of funding from the New York State Legislature and Governor Andrew Cuomo. Our keynote speaker is here, and he has 
More information about being sure Long Island's environmental issues are addressed in Albany. He is New York State Senate Majority Leader and Long Islander, John Flanagan. You know, as I'm sitting at the table, and I'm looking at all the tables across the room, think of how wonderful it is, and yet how fragile and perilous it is that we have pitchers of water, and you know what we do? We pour it in a glass, we drink it, we don't always think about it, but God knows we're so fortunate to have the resources right at our fingertips. In terms of where we are, Senator Hannon, as smart as anybody who serves in the legislature, period. Policy wonk to the highest order. And he has been outspoken, along with uh, Assemblyman Thiel and Engelbright, about a bond act. The governor deserves credit. Yes, my name's John Flanagan. I'm a Republican. Governor Cuomo's a Democrat. He deserves credit for what he advanced in terms of his budget and what we ultimately enacted. So we went from $2 billion to $2.5. And I don't have to delineate, because it was already done quite, uh, quite fairly by my colleagues, uh, by listening a novel concept in Albany. By listening, we actually earmarked money for the Pine Barrens, for Stony Brook, for Septic, for all kinds of other programs. We're talking about statewide money. Now, I know the role that I play, but I'm parochial. You know, I represent Huntington, Smithtown, and Brookhaven. Peter Scully is one of my constituents. I'm proud to say that. So are we going to try and fight to make sure that we have appropriate resources for Long Island? Absolutely. <laughs> See, Ad Adrian knows this. Anytime I can get Dick Amper to clap, I'm in a good spot. Okay? I really don't have to say anything else. But I do believe this, too. I think people are willing to make true, real investments. And if you come to them with a fair plan, number one, they're going to listen. Number two, they're not going to be so circumspect about taking money out of their pocket because they know where it goes. Now, in the, I'll close on this. And I should have started with this. Let me say thank you. Thank you to everybody who is passionate. I see people like Kevin, um, who just all the not-for-profits, people who do this day in and day out, you make us better legislators, quite frankly. So let me express my gratitude. I want to make sure that you feel that whether it's Senator Elaine Phillips or Kemp Pannon or Kenny Laval or Phil Boyle or Tom Croce or even John Flanagan, along with my colleagues, that you can come up and say, yeah, Thiel's my guy. Engelbright's my guy. Flanagan's maybe not such a good guy, but he's at least my guy. But if you take somebody like a Kemp Hannon and our newest colleague, again, Senator Phillips, we have not only an obligation, but a responsibility to make sure that we're doing the people's business. So I hope all of you have a great day and stay dry. And I've learned, working in Albany, I've learned how to walk between the raindrops. Thank you very much. David, thank you. So that was a great program, but definitely more than we can cover in just one program. Absolutely right. So, but it looks like Long Islanders are making great progress. So I think we'll come back again next time and talk to some more presenters and some more of the attendees. It's really a good sign, all the progress we're making. Absolutely. So join us again next time. We'll find out more about what others are doing in and out of government to improve water quality all across the island. I'm Dick Amper. And I'm Kathleen Nasta. See you next time. Long Island Pine Barrens. Let's protect them.